Hi, everyone. Welcome. Salam. My name is Indrajit. My website is uh, indie.ca. And this is sort of a first because normally I get on here and blather with some quotes here and there. And this time I'm going to read a book directly and put my quotes only in between. Actually, it's probably not true. I'll probably go on a blather as well. The other first is that I'm doing this because my friend Jahan Mendes asked for a recommendation of some like podcasts about Xi Jinping and China because I told him the Economist one was dubious given you know, their yellow peril sort of economist covers going on and just the obvious sort of brutal track record of The Economist of being a sort of Oxford, Cambridge, elite propaganda outlet. But I digress. So my friend Jahan Mendes asked for a podcast about where he could follow that, and I gave him some books. And then he was like, you know, I need something I can do while I'm, like, working out or whatever, like, wanking off. Um, so... I thought I'd just make a podcast because I recommended this book, Wang Huning. So to me, jumping in and learning about Xi Jinping now, I, I wouldn't feel, I, I still don't feel confident doing it. And I've been like trying to learn about China for years now. So for me, I started with like Confucius and then Mencius, Zhuangzi, the Taoists to get an understanding of like philosophy is and where stuff like comes from. Um, then I read some <clears throat> like historical fiction, Romance of the Three Kingdoms fantastic sort of application of the art of war and just one of the best like dramatic sort of war stories and like histories in its own like emotional way that that I've ever read fantastic book um and yeah I've just been like chewing my way through there so to be honest I can't jump into Xi Jinping because I'm still in like the 1400s I haven't even got to the 1400s yet um but to jump a bit ahead, there is some writer, I read this website called readingthechinadream.org, which publishes works in translation. And it publishes, you know, some academic works, some, uh, they're not like magazine articles. Th these are sort of longer pieces, more serious debates, like engaging with, uh, which, with each other's uh, speeches at conferences and so on. Really fascinating intellectually, actually. Um, a lot to agree with and disagree with. And really sort of, shows you it's a lie that like China is this like monolithic place with like no free speech like to be honest I f get more robust debate about democracy and sort of like capitalism and even communism from within the Chinese debate sphere than from the western one when in the western one I was just reading something where it says like you can't even criticize like like they're talking about NPR National Public Radio in the United States and they're saying that you know it just they always accept that like capitalism is like the only possible system. Anything else is like a joke or laughable. And then they always do whatever just to like preserve the power of their like liberal elites while assuaging their consciences. Whereas there's real debates about like power and what it means within the Chinese discourse. And one of those thinkers who's very interesting is this guy named Wang Huning. And Wang Huning is interesting because he's on the Politburo now and then there's some like super Politburo which is like a smaller crew, and he's like on that. And he has significant like internal power within the party. And he's considered to be one of like the th real thinkers behind Xi Jinping. Now, these guys are all like examined up the ass and like published and academic in their own way. But Wang Huning is like, <clears throat> like the academic among academics there. Um, so it's just interesting seeing what he's thinking. Now, as we read this book, I must tell you, this book is a bootleg. Because it's actually this book, like, around the time COVID uh, kicked off, it became, like, a very hot property. And it, like, you can get a hard copy, and I think it costs hundreds of dollars. And then the soft copies, it's, like, it's not, like, an official translation. This has just, like, been translated. Um, so I can't vouch for all of it, but certainly it's a, it's a fantastic fiction, if it is. No, I, I think this one's really by Wang Huning. I just can't, you can't, like, account for, like, the translation. So let's just jump into it. Because I said I wouldn't talk a lot, and yet here I am. So I'll read from his words, and I'll just give you a little snap when I come in and out of someone else's words. You know, it's not me. So from late August 1988, I was invited to the United States for a six-month academic visit. During that time, I visited more than 30 cities and nearly 20 universities, did research in dozens of government and private sectors, and discussed the United States with a wide range of Americans and foreigners. I documented my daily discussions, visits, and observations, and this book was born. So that's Wang Huning, just putting you in context. So 1988, like, I think George W. Bush had just gotten in, and I was in grade two. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
and this, my friend Matt McKinsey did a great George W. Bush or H. W. Sorry, George H. W. Bush imitation. And my first grade teacher, who really inspired me to get into writing, was Carol Stewart. I mean, she told me what a Reagan fan she was, and how she was happy about Bush. She's a lovely lady. Um, I digressed again. My gosh. So, this is Huning again. So he just talks about how oh, this is me. So he just he talks about how he's going to talk about the material historical conditions of America. And he said, it is difficult to analyze and understand the United States without this logic. I just want to answer a simple question by, dissect, by dissecting the multiple dimensions of society. Why is there an America? This question is simple, uh, but is far beyond my ability to do so, and I know it well. So that's just fascinating. Like, why is America? <clears throat> and the title is America Against America, which seems quite accurate, right? Because America is so insulated from like knowing war or physical threats on like land base that they were able to become like a naval power and the only thing that really can take America down is America. And this book was published in 1991. Now let's get to my highlights. So I'm getting these are in like no particular order. Okay. So Huning says, the mechanisms that exist in American society, both good and bad, are the product of the historical, social, cultural conditions of that society. And they exist only in that environment and cannot simply be applied to other societies. Now, this is really against the idea of America. So the idea of America is that America is an idea, and that idea can be thought by any country anywhere else in the world, and they can like be like America. And so that is sort of the Western development model. And he's saying that it's like the development of a society is much more complicated than an idea. It's a historical, social, cultural condition, and it cannot be applied to other societies. I think this is a fundamental point that Americans don't get. And, uh, yeah, I think it's a good point. So Hunin continues, My analysis in this book shows that, powerful, shows that the powerful groups that dominate politics are above the common people. The constraints of private property on political democracy in the capitalist system of the United States cannot be ignored. A true political democracy must therefore involve the right of the governed to control economic policy through their representatives. So that's like a real difference between sort of the Chinese and economic or American conception of freedom. So there's this idea that in America, like your worst person is to free to do whatever the fuck they want. Whereas in China, there's more the sense that you have like the freedom to like have clothes and food and shelter and not be starving. Like they actually have like policies and the concept of like rights for things like clothing and housing and like food. Um, and of course they've had their definite struggles with like that. In the past, so when you think of China, you're always thinking of like famines and like communism, and and you're thinking of communism in that sense. And they did have famines, but the famines, and they had historical famines for hundreds of years. If you read the histories, um, but the famines actually sort of stopped after the communist era, after the Great Leap backwards, which was catastrophic. But then, since then, they haven't had famines. In fact, now as the world goes into food insecurity, they have some of the best food like stores for their for their people. Um, and China's lifted more people out of poverty than at any time in human history, just in scale and capacity. And I went to some, like, webinar on it. I thought it was just, like, they just gave people money or whatever, but they didn't. They actually had, like, cadres go to, like, the village level. And, like, that was their job, was, like, eliminate poverty. Their job wasn't, like, build road or... I mean, maybe those things were important, and they coordinated with other people to do those things. But their job was just, like, eliminate poverty. And they went down and, like, were with the people. So that was interesting. And <clears throat> let's keep going. Um, so he says, the influence of left ideology, which took class struggle as the outline, which disturbed our perspective of the whole world and prevented people from learning from advanced experience of other countries. Yeah, so I actually don't even understand what's happening there. I'm sorry I read that. So uh, let's keep going. Okay, so this is just about the idea. So when we talk about like a Western development model, right? So anybody can just like be like America. <clears throat> One thing that counters this is that Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, and South Korea did not have political democracy during their economic takeoff stage. Hong Kong was under colonial rule, Taiwan was under one-party dictatorship, and South Korea was under military intervention. So, I mean, we've been trying international development for about 60 years now, right? So some cases have come in. And the logic of like... Western development is that like, okay, you need to get a democracy in place. You need to have like, <clears throat> like rule of law. You need to change your governments like every few years. Um, <clears throat> and then you will like develop and like as if development comes from that. When historically, like none of the Western countries developed like that. And 
even the com- the countries that have have succeeded under capitalism, which actually have developed, and it's actually vanishingly few, um, and it's all basically one region. But even those countries, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, and South Korea, did not have political democracy and were in fact like dictatorships, um, which is an interesting point. So thus, people in developing countries cannot enjoy the best products produced in their own countries, not even the second-class products. This is because the second-class products are intended for consumption by foreigners who come to those countries. Yeah, what that means. I mean, I know I can think about it. So when he talks about, he's really interested in like the he he's a bureaucrat you call him Mandarin, and he's really interested in like the administrative system of the United States. So the question he's asking is, can a political and administrative system bear all the burdens of modern society? This is a difficult question for all countries. From both theoretical and practical aspects, I'm afraid that no political and administrative system has the capacity to directly manage and assume all the responsibilities. Because the energy of any political and administrative system is limited, for small countries, the government has the possibility to hold its own, as in Singapore, Hong Kong, South Korea. For large societies, especially those with hundreds of millions of people, it is unlikely the government can directly and comprehensively manage all levels and areas of society. So a prerequisite for the realization, he's talking about what kind of structure would be, a prerequisite for the realization of this structure is to enable the various spheres of social life to form a self-organizing system that decouples these specific and complex spheres of activity from political activity. So he's talking about how See, I'll, I'll actually keep going. Commodification is the catalyst for this transformation process. The problems of housing, food, transportation, employment, and education are the basic dilemmas that plague every society. Many governments are plagued by these problems and cannot get out of them. The desire to retreat is not an option, and the desire to advance is not an option. The high degree of commodification has created a more particular structure in the American society in these areas. So what he gets into, this sort of development models... And what he sees in the United States is that they've effectively privatized a lot of, like, government functions or societal functions. Yeah, I mean, that seems, like, obvious. And he says that the interesting thing about reading Chinese stuff is compared to, like, Western stuff is they're not, like, attacking. They're trying to, like, learn. Like, he went to there to learn. I was just reading this thing in Foreign Policy where they were reviewing, like, a course about Xi Jinping thought. And the guy was just, like, sneering at it and saying that it's like, what did you learn? Like, I mean... You should also learn from your enemy. In fact, like, I mean, that's what the art of war says. Like, there's no, actually, no, it's Ender's Game. Ender's Game says that there's, like, no greater teacher than your enemy. And art of war also says, and just, yeah, common sense. Like, any athlete or competitor knows that, like, your enemy is, like, what drives you. Like, Matthew Johnson, Larry Bird, so on. Um, yeah, and just saying that your enemy is a dumbass and just makes you a dumbass, to be honest. That's a trap I think a lot of American thinkers fall into, thinking that they're so free. So, you... Like, when he looks at the United States, he says, like, in this society, the abundance and variety of food is amazing, even to the point of being wasteful. The system of supplying food is completely commoditized. The development of the commodity economy has led to a dual structure of governance in society. The social self-organized system is responsible for all kinds of specific matters, and the political system is responsible for coordinating the various self-organized systems. That's an interesting way of looking at America, right? It's thought of, like, as a government of people, but it's obviously not, right? It's a government of, like, the rich and corporations. And in that sense, what... Yeah, I mean, even I put that as just like a moral failing and you shouldn't do things that way. But Huning is looking at it more generously as in like, that's, they, they have commodified a lot of their stuff simply because the administrative burden of administering 300x million people is actually too much. So they've thought of, or it's not that it's too much, but it's difficult. So they've taken that difficult problem and they've outsourced it to the private sector and they sort of just like work with the private sector to manage the society. And, I mean, to a large degree, of course, that's what they've done with their military, right? They don't make, like, tanks and bombs anymore. They coordinate with, like, four arms dealers. So they've done that for, like, a lot of stuff, like healthcare, like, whatever. Um, housing. I mean, there's actually very few companies and rich people that control all these things. But Huning's not judgmental about it. Oh, but here we are. Then he does make a judgment. He says, commodification in many ways corrupts society and leads to a number of serious social problems. These problems, in turn, can increase the pressure on the political and administrative system. So yeah, I mean, I guess he is making a judgment, which I would make, which is this is a bad way to do things. Like trusting like rich people to like do your work just ends up with you working for them. So it doesn't work. It it, it just corrupt it is corruption. It's like it's a lot of money changing hands. It's like it's like corrupt. So Amanat, yeah. Kind of the farm, okay. 
So he then he talks about like the social characteristics where it's like there is an obsession with work in America, which my parents also raised me with, like growing up in America. Um, <clears throat> so he describes America. There's a nightmare to me, blah, blah, blah. I love to experiment. Okay, love to experiment. The United States itself is one of the largest experimental fields. Since every group is a gamble, a chance, then the Americans are gamblers and opportunists. They rarely stay in one place, full of care about moving. They do not like the same old thing, always love to do what others have not done, willing to accept the challenge. And that's like a part of like American-ism that like I inherited into my personality. He said, uh, it is democratic and completely equal. The environment opens the way for talent and luck. Their democracy is a social democracy, not an economic one. The concept of equality permeates the sphere of American life and thought. Their behavior, work, recreation, language and literature, religion and politics all reflect the concept of equality. And real life is governed by it. In fact, economic inequality is conceived of as, in, as equality. That's a fascinating insight. I think it's one of the best in the book. So there's a lot of other thinkers on reading The China Dream who'd really talk about that distinction between... So China considers itself a democracy, and, and I would also. like. I mean, democracy is a varied form, if you look at the philosophical thing of what is a democracy, going back to Aristotle. Um, you can have democracy. Even in the United States, you, you have a minority of people that can vote or that do vote govern the majority um and every democracy throughout history has been like that there's some in group of like citizens and of course there's people who's american pol like i think iraq like they should be able to vote in american elections like that's a, even rome had like a vague sense of that um just the concept of citizenship as dmitry kochanov gets into it, it is an arbitrary exclusive category and it sets the rules for democracy so there's the way the united states does it isn't necessarily better than the chinese one and Aristotle would be confused at the concept that it was. They thought representative democracy itself was like, led to oligarchy and was shit. Um, I digress. But within the Chinese debate, there is this concept of the different types of democracy. Let's start there. Just accept it as a philosophical principle. So he's saying here it's a social democracy, not an economic one. So I, I think it's really you get like a lot of participation prizes, but no cash. So America has like a lot of like political activity that you can get involved in. And like it's part of their like identity. But in terms of like the money and the military stuff, other people are in control. So yeah, it's a, he says, and he, there is that attitude where like <clears throat> freedom is construed of as the freedom to become rich. That's a freedom. So whether you are poor, whether your granddaddy was poor, whether your great granddaddy was poor, like you, that's just the fact that you have that freedom makes you like put an American flag on your truck. Like, that's considered of, considered as, yeah, the, the expected value, right? Just the expected value that they could be a billionaire someday is worth like 10 million to every American walking around right now. That's why they act like that. They, they feel like they could be rich. Like they're one like rap song or they're one like, I don't know why people do, but they're, they're like one hit away from becoming rich and being able to like be a full participant in their society, an actual player in their democracy. And that's considered as something they all share. So in that way, inequality is conceived of as equality. So when talking about the American creed, Huning says, what is the American creed? According to Huntington, it can be summarized as number one, freedom, number two, equality, number three, individualism, number four, democracy, and number five, the rule of law. It seems so simple and clear. Here lies the human dilemma. Even a simple idea is difficult to become the dominant idea in society, and it cannot be effective without the efforts of several generations. Naturally, the American creed and American practice do not exactly match. I think that's self-explanatory. Because most people believe in these tenets, the first thing people think of when they erupt is to better embody them, not to change them. So there are different views of freedom and equality, with the Republican Party focusing on freedom and the Democratic Party focusing on equality. So if we talk about equality of conditions and not the equality of results, it seems that we, can, we cannot conclude that there is a general equality of conditions at the time. He's talking about Tocqueville. That hasn't changed. The contemporary neoconservative notion is that Lincoln only gave freedom to blacks, not equality, which is true. Um, because equality guaranteed by the Western political system is only formal political equality, not uh, social or economic equality. And I, I agree with that. And I think you need to think about democracy that way. Like, people are like, oh, but we can vote here. And we can, like, say whatever the fuck we want about the government. It's like, okay, some people can't actually say what they want about the government. Like, ask Julian Assange or ask a lot of the Black Lives Matters protesters who've gotten followed up, and ask the Ferguson protesters, who've, some of whom have been killed, and ask anybody who tries to say anything about a fucking crooked cop in their neighborhood. Like, there are people in L.A. who are government officials who are investigating the a crooked sheriff's department, and 
that sheriff's department went and raided those people's houses. Like, you know, those are essentially people within the court system. So, yeah, not everybody's free, man. That's, uh, just try saying something actually controversial. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so what people have is formal political equality. So that, like, it's the idea that you can, like, say whatever the fuck you want and, like, vote. And, of course, people are suppressed from voting as well. And if you read anything about democracy in the philosophical sense, democracy is about power. It's not, you could get power through uh, sortition, which is putting random people in parliament. You could distribute power through aristocracy, through dictatorship. And people don't actually have, and look, as Americans know, like, it's all about the Benjamins. Like, if you don't have money, if you don't have control over cash, you do not have power. Like, rappers have taught me this, if nothing else. And Americans know this. And so they don't actually have power. They just got, like, put fucking choose of red or blue. It's like a bunch of rabbits in a fucking, it's like rats in a cage, as the Smashing Pumpkins said. It's like, despite all my rage, I'm still just a rat in a cage. So the issue of political equality has been greatly improved, though not resolved, by the post-war black civil rights movement, the women's rights movement. The issue of economic inequality, however, has never been substantially advanced. So I think America as a democracy, or as like what we consider modern, was only really founded by black people in like the 1940s to the 1960s, 70s. Um... Like, those, that was the first time they had, like, actual freedom. Before that, it was a fucking totalitarian, like, Nazi state. Like, the idea that you would ever call that a democracy is mind-boggling. Um, so, but even then, so Martin Luther King also talked about economic issues, but I got left out because, like, I have a dream. Like, he talked about race because that mattered, and they were created black and, like, made that category. But he talked about, like, working-class peoples, poor peoples, you know, what Jesus talked about. Like, the, the rights and dignity of the poor. And that was, he was very Christian in that sense. And that equality has not advanced at all. In fact, since the 1980s, it's, it's, it's only gone back. So Huning continues, but equality in the economic and social spheres has been slow to advance because it's considered to be in the realm of liberty. And freedom is inviolable, especially the right of freedom to property. property. Yeah, so this is a central contradiction within the American conception of freedom, which is, <clears throat> like at some point, with, with like private property, like, like, when he buys up beach land, private, physical private property, that impinges on other people's freedom to, like, use the beach there. Like, Hawaiians, like, native Hawaiians. Like, private property intrinsically takes someone else's freedom away. But then the argument, which is this weird argument, which is that, like, no, but I'm free to fuck with you. It's like a petulant child's argument, but, like, people want the freedom to, like, fuck with someone else. And then, you know, based on that $10 million lottery ticket of every American is holding in their pocket, that maybe someday they could be in a position to fuck with other people, like be on top. And they'll take those odds. Even though the odds are getting slimmer and slimmer. But they'll take those odds because they're walking around with like the feeling of having $10 million in their pocket. <clears throat> and they, you know, they want that sh outside shot that they could just be it someday. That and bougie. So, <clears throat> blah, 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 Constitution. Okay. Later political. The people who first came to America, having been subjected to religious and political persecution in England, had the strongest desire for political security, the deepest awareness of their rights. Yeah, I don't go too much in the founders, sorry. Yeah, this is... So then he, I think he went to an inauguration thing. Or I think he, like, witnessed it. Yeah, because this is when Bush was, like, coming into power. Yeah, how did he experience this? Was the inauguration day? No, I think he just, like, was in the country. I don't think he was invited to this thing. Um, sometimes political rules and political traditions are more powerful than laws. It's true. Capitalism had not encountered a crisis. Yeah, the 1930s. The philosophical belief of liberalism is that people are rational and can control and regulate themselves as long as the necessary conditions are created for them to do so. Conservatism believes so that people are irrational and norms should be made for their behavior. Yeah, I mean, I guess. Liberal government, third republic, history. Okay, so... Now he's talking about the character of American people, and I'll skip through this, but there's some interesting stuff. He says, Americans' world consciousness is, on the whole, much weaker than that of those people whom West Americans or Westerners regard as backward and ignorant. That's true. Like, a lot of Americans don't know anything, like, outside of America. But So when I lived in Ohio, yeah, I never went to the West Coast of America. Like, I never went past Chicago. And I never went further south than, like, Tennessee, which isn't far. So my world was, like, very small. And your world can be tiny, man. Like, people, not, yeah, people in my town lived in... Went to school at the same university and came back at the same time. The use of human ability to conquer nature is one of the values of the American tradition. So blah, 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 of course, yeah. Um, new and, yeah, so they're new and innovative to the extreme. 
their traditional values are abstract at their core. Like, it's not like a culture which has, like, relationships with, like, nature or, like, animals or, I don't know, history or their ancestors in a significant way. It's like relationships between, like, sports teams, which are constantly, like, moving. And, I don't know, consumer goods and, like, food from, like, immigrants. I don't know. I won't go into that too much. Third, the mechanism of society forces people to innovate. The reason when I say force, because if you want to win, you can, it cannot be without innovation. There are two mechanisms that force people to innovate. One is the primacy of money. <clears throat> Anyone or any group that wants to get money or more money must be different and must constantly introduce newer things to attract people and society. Yeah, since childhood, Americans have grown up with the atmosphere. America first in the world. Most of them believe in that, yeah. Individualism makes people more prone, yeah. America is the least mysterious society. People grow up in this society with little mystery about any matter. Yeah, there's this idea that, like, just you just everything's known or, like, we do know it. Like, we're on top. Like, we're number one, for sure. Yeah, the progress of science and technology lies in the continuous conquest and victory over nature. And if one is full of mystery about nature or some aspects of nature, one cannot take a big step into the temple of nature to see what it's all about. But will linger outside and pray for divine blessing. Yeah, I mean, the American attitude is like, you know, Armageddon or all their movies, right? Just like a bunch of plucky guys who just have the will to do it and get punched a few times and get up. Like, they can do it. And I think the destruction of nature is intrinsic to, like, America and the model of American development, which is why it leads to climate collapse. It just inexorably leads there. So Hooning continues, Americans have almost no belief in ghosts. Americans invent and conceive of many ghosts, probably more than any other country in the world, but do not believe in ghosts. Children have no concept of ghosts. During Halloween, children dress up as all kinds of ghosts move around this neighborhood. Halloween, they're actually celebrating here, which should be nice. <clears throat> so I'll skip ahead because I'm actually getting tired. In the face of some, yeah, in the face of their problems, they tend to think of a scientific or technological problem. Like even with COVID-19, which is a big social collapse, they think the solution is like one quick shot vaccine. Now, if you want to overwhelm the Americans, you must do one thing, surpass them in science and technology. Yeah, and that's why they're actually fucking scared now. Yeah, they're scared of China now. So it's an interesting thing to read. I'm afraid then, yeah. The development of the... Mit yeah, okay, hold on. Yeah, so many families use the American way of raising children, which is to encourage independence. Children are placed in separate rooms at an early age and left to their own devices. In some sense, this is good for child development. However, in a combination of certain factors, it can also lead to a sense of isolation in children. Yeah, so the reason I left America and then, I mean, I left directly from Canada, um, is I felt lonely there. I got depressed. And... Yeah, like, in Sri Lanka, you're just, like, surrounded by, like, so many people. Um, and that made me feel better. And, like, my wife's family is very close, and that support to me. There's different stuff, right? Like, you're if you have a good fa family, it's good. But if you have a bad family, it's jail. Um, so th that ability of, like, being able to get out of a situation is interesting and important in America. But it leads to a different sort of society. No, actually, I think it's fundamentally bad. Like, Mark Fisher talks about that. How It just leads to, like, depression. <laughs> like, we need social contact. Loneliness, yeah. Human loneliness is a product of social institutes, institutions, and it's difficult to find solutions as long as such social institutions remain intact. Yeah, so I think American institutions create loneliness. They don't really, like, I mean, it's like you can't have a family of more than two people. You just can't afford it. So, like, you get smaller families. Like, you can't buy land close to each other and, like, live. So you live far away and you drive a car. You need a car to go somewhere, so it costs gas. So you need a flight, so everything costs money. Like, everything fucking costs money. You said I'm lonely. And the institutions drive this. They're just lonely institutions. There's a book called Bowling Alone, which sort of like talks about this happening. Education, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Due to the developed economy. So this is the, the thing about America, right? It's all about that lottery ticket in your pocket. He said, due to the developed economy material abundance, there are some problems that are easier to solve in America and do, do not require a complicated operational process. A person who does the most difficult and tiring work, road repair, cleaners, porters, etc., after taking the money, can buy any goods in the store, can go stay in any high-class hotel, go to any restaurant, most of the things rich people can do, others with money. So yeah, there's that feeling that, like, even though you're not doing it, you kind of could do it, but you can't do it. You save up all your money. Because you do make enough money to, like, get a car sometimes, or, like, you could spend that car money if you wanted to, on, like, you know, what some people spend on, like, fucking croissants in a week. Um, yeah, so there's that sense of that lottery ticket in your pocket, which also, like, gives you some, like, returns right now. So Huning says Western economies and societies operate on the principle of the invisible hand, the economic lever, the market, that the market regulates economic movement. And yeah, okay, look, man, I'm getting bored now. I'm only 114 pages in. I don't know how long this is. 
If it's interesting, I'll continue it later. Tell me if it's interesting. I don't even know how long I've been talking for now. But I'm tired. And if I'm tired, you must be tired of listening to me. So, that's all for now. And this is a podcast. And if you want to read a website, uh, check out worldwideweb.indie.ca. I-N-D-I-C-A. Indica. Like the weed.